Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Nathan Lusley. I'm series editor for Best Small Fictions 2020. I was also um, series editor for the uh, Best Small Fictions 2019. Welcome to our second uh, Best Small Fictions reading. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce so many wonderful authors to you all today uh, who will read their work and, um, you know, uh, share all this, all this great work from Best Small Fictions um, 2020. We have the new book is just out. Um, I just got my copy a couple days ago um, for authors and people who have made orders already. You should be getting your copies very soon. If you look behind me, you can probably see a few, you know, copies floating around in my in my dungeon um, bookshelf here. So um, congratulations to all the authors um, and presses and magazines who have been included in this anthology. It's a real cause for celebration. Just a couple quick um, announcements and thank yous first, and then we'll get rolling with the readings. Um, first of all, um, I would like to really thank um, a lot of people for this um, particular anthology. Uh, Sondra Press especially, who has been so supportive of flash fiction and this form. Um, I say flash fiction, but we also have work that is not technically fiction, um, but it's prosy or prose poetry that we consider fiction-like. Um, we also have uh, a huge staff of volunteers and uh, interns as well who've really helped with uh, putting together this anthology and helping to make it possible and promote it and so forth. I would also really like to thank all of the authors, um, publications, and presses who have contributed to this wonderful um, anthology. We couldn't really do it without you, of course. Um, Let's see, a couple other things. Uh, if you're interested in ordering um, additional copies of the anthology, um, please visit sonderpress.com, which I'm typing here in chat. Um, and by the way, on the chat, feel free to, to type anything you like on the, on the side um, within reason, uh, especially plaudits and insights regarding the various pieces you hear this evening, this afternoon. Um, we'll see. Also, I do have extra copies of the 2019 anthology if anyone's interested um, on discounts, just PM me or just shoot me a message and I can um, hook you up with that. Um, one other announcement, we also have a Best Small Fiction event uh, in January 2021, 6 p.m. January 8th is the date there. And this one will be um, 6 p.m. Eastern Eastern Standard Time. This this one will be a BSF flash bomb um, reading hosted by Paul Beckman um, in New York City. Um, so that particular reading will focus primarily on authors from the east side of town, uh, East Coast um, authors, so to speak. Uh, today's reading, of course, primarily focuses on writers from the west side of town, west of the Mississippi or thereabouts, primarily. Okay, so um, as we get rolling, I'd like to introduce um, each author in turn and then turn it over to them to actually read their work. So first up is Elson Akavandaz, whose work has appeared in The Rumpus, The Portland Review, Rattle, Lost Balloon, and other publications. He has an MA in creative writing from Sacramento State University and until now was I was worried he peaked in sixth grade when he won a short story uh, contest and the state free throw championship. To learn more, please visit uh, ellisonalcavandaz.com. So here to tell us about the assimilation of Boy Boy Santos from Lost Balloon is Ellison. Thanks, Nathan. Um, all right. On the morning of the annual Santos sibling karaoke contest, Boy Boy told the police he was Justin Timberlake. Previously, he'd been other famous white American men, Bill Clinton, George Clooney, and for one inexplicable weekend, Batman. He never dressed the part, not that it would have mattered. Of my nine brothers, Boy Boy was the shortest and the darkest and owned the flattest face. No amount of makeup or costuming could make him pass as a white man. In fact, he looked so Filipino that random strangers automatically spoke to him in Tagalog, as though he'd just arrived from Manila and hadn't yet adopted his new American skin. Or maybe it was his name. The genesis of Boy Boy's name is one of contention. 
According to Junior, dad's nickname was Boy growing up. So we named him Boy's Boy, the mom, the stickler that she was, thought apostrophes didn't belong in people's names. Thus, Boy Boy. Robert says that since Boy Boy was the youngest and the smallest, dad thought calling him Boy twice might someday make him a man. I, however, know the truth. When Boy Boy was born, our family was months away from moving to the States. Dad and mom worried their youngest would have no ties to his Filipino roots, gave him the most absurd Filipino name they could think of. With that name, they said, there's no way he will ever become one of them. I found Boy Boy on the corner of Calvine and Mac, dressed in a plaid shirt and jean shorts. He held a comb to his mouth as a microphone. He danced too, though most people wouldn't call it dancing. The cops had arrived before me. They stood against their cars with their arms folded across their chests, laughing their white faces off. Boy Boy smiled at the audience as he pumped his fist and spun on his toes. I stayed in my car and watched. It would be better for him to get arrested again, I thought. I drove off. Boy Boy waved as I sped by. None of us expected Boy Boy at the contest, but after we had already sung, he arrived. He didn't look at any of us as he strutted through the house, stopped at the microphone stand, picked up the remote and selected his song. For five minutes, he sung without his usual accent. In fact, he sung so perfectly, all of us closed our eyes. When he finished, we opened our eyes to find our brother standing in the middle of the room, though he was tall and blonde and his skin was the color of ivory. Robert jumped off the couch and tackled him while Junior called 911. But all I could think about was that he finally did what dad and mom said he'd never do. Thanks. Awesome job. Wonderful. So I'm trying to find myself. All right. Um, next up, we have uh, Liz Brazil, who uh, received a, a 2020 Creative Writing Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and won the 2018 Prairie Schooner Book Prize for Fiction for her first book, Extinction Events Stories. She holds an MFA from Bowling Green State University and lives in Denver, where she works at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and teaches at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Here to tell us about Guide to Dead Girls on TV from Monkey Bicycle is Liz Brazil. Thank you, Nathan. Um, okay. A guide to dead girls on TV. One, already dead girls. Already dead girls are easy to write. They do not require speech or action or emotion or growth. They have been hoisted up, trussed, their hands starred out against a dark background the men leave them dangling from ceilings or trees or hogtied on the ground or yoked to bedposts, forgetting them as they forget roadkill, a rotted portion of scenery. The camera lingers on already dead girls because their beauty is in their silence, in the space they do not take up, the bodies they no longer own. Already dead girls are more dead than girl. They are lands waiting to be colonized. The husks of already dead girls are the most valuable commodities in the world. Two, dead schoolgirls. A dead schoolgirl is significant, forces male protagonist to remember his own dead child, his own sorrowful past, proves something good still exists in him the same way handing money to a homeless man does or saving a cat from traffic. Dead school girls never emerge from adolescence. Instead of blooming into young women, they blossom into bruises. They are the martyrs of male sins, so the brutality is more important than the girl. Because male protagonist needs something to react to, something to recoil from. Even male protagonist is proven to be sensitive, to be good, by the deaths of dead school girls. But the point of dead school girls is to never exist, to be a void in a family photograph an absence of footsteps, a house at which a, school, at which a school bus no longer stops. Their impact is in what they will not do, the women they will not become. Three, sick girls. Sick girls are gentle creatures. They're brave 
and they look perfect in hospital beds as though they have always lived there. They move so little that they are like jellyfish in aquariums, bobbing and strange and luminous and deflatable. Sick girls do not have wishes for themselves, only for their men, and only after they are gone. Their victimhood is clear. They wear it draped over their bodies in lips so chapped it is like they are covered in spun sugar and faces made angelic by hollowness and veins the color of blue sky, veiled by translucent cloud skin. For there is no ugliness in sick girls. There is only a suggestion of pain, a ghost of discomfort, a specter rattling pans and shifting furniture just out of sight. Four, victims. Victims are white. They are vaguely Christian, probably virgins, conventionally pretty, with features that could be molded from any number of women. Sometimes they wear crosses on gold chains that are so thin they shimmer like seams of water. Victims are not humans, but receptacles of pain. And they have done nothing to deserve this violence, these unicorns of women. They are innocent in the way babies are, never quite actualized, never making decisions, never acting on their own. Victims are the color of snow, the unpainted cheeks of dolls. They are checkboxes ticked by their relationships to men. Daughter, mother, sister, wife. Five, not victims. Not victims are at fault somehow for walking alone or leaving their drinks unattended or going home with a stranger. Everything about them says they were asking for it. And this way, no one actually needs to speak the words. Their smudged lipstick, their dark nebula of eyeshadow, all a Rorschach test reflecting. The men do not touch them with care. Their necks are like the necks of bottles, made of glass primed for shattering. Police do not move urgently, not for not victims. An officer will joke about not victims' jobs or their appearances or what they were wearing. And the others may not laugh, but no one says stop. Six, actresses who play dead girls. When the day is over, the dead girl rises. She yanks on her clothes, snags her chignon on the back of her shirt, leaves the bun dangling, hair tickling her neck like fingernails. She snatches her purse, rushes off the set across the lot before anyone can remove her makeup, the constellation of injuries still patterning her face. The dead girl claws her keys between her knuckles. She checks her back seat before entering her car. It has been a long day. The dead girl laid in a morgue set for hours as actors, all men, perched their hands too long on her body, not violently and not angrily, but as though they didn't notice her, this extension of their peripheral vision, this black-eyed set dressing. She could only take so much of it, so much of it, sandcastle body naked under the sheet, the air and the set and the fake morgue full only of men, their sea foam breath, their shark tooth words, their sea cliff bodies. It reminded the dead girl, eyes closed, of other times she has pretended to be lifeless. The dead girl stops at a grocery store. People ask, sweetie, are you all right? Do you need help? The dead girl, for a moment, forgets the correct answers, which are, yes, she's fine. No, she doesn't need help. When the dead girl gets home, she has no trouble recognizing herself in the mirror. She massages the palette of blue, black, jaundice yellow on her forehead, her cheeks circling her eyes, but it doesn't hurt, not in the way probing a wound should. It is a pressure, a dull fortified moment. And if the dead girl closes her eyes, she wonders if she could tell who was doing the touching. Because there were other times hands were laid on her, soft or calloused or empty or clenched. And each time she performed like today, closed her eyes, focused without focusing on the patterns in the darkness, the swooping, swirling pixels in colors shadowy and rich. She begins to scrub. This seems like the correct way to bring herself back to life. Except it stains the makeup. It clings to her skin. Thank you. Amazing job, thank you so much. Um, is Samantha Edmonds here? Samantha, are you here? Okay. Moving on to the next person. 
Um, okay, next up we have Jen Fox. And uh, let me tell you about Jen. Uh, Jen Fox, uh, her story, her debut uh, story collection, Mannequin and Wife, is forthcoming in September 2020 from LSU Press. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in One Story, Crazy Horse, The, the Iowa Review, Shenandoah, Joyland, Michigan Quarter Review, and elsewhere. She is the winner of the 2020, sorry, 2019 Pinch Award in Fiction and the 2019 John Gardner Memorial Fiction Prize from Harper Pallet. Jenna is a four-time Pushcart Prize nominee and two-time finalist for the Italio Calvino Prize in Fabulous Fiction. Here to tell us about Dear Dolores Dale is Jen Fox. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, hi. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to read my piece. Um, this originally appeared in um, Pigeonholes, um, and this piece of flash is called Dear Dolores Dale. I represent the estate of one Walter K. Brennan, owner of a popular Midwestern chain of fast food eateries. 12 days ago, Mr. Brennan lost a brief but grueling battle with esophageal cancer, and I have now disposed of his assets as instructed, with the exception of a single item, an item he bequeathed to you. I know you never met Walter Brennan, Mrs. Dale, and are probably wondering what I am playing at, if I am some psycho merely masquerading as an attorney. Let me assure you, nothing could be further from the truth, though at times I think I might prefer institutional life to shaking hands and arguing cases to sitting in snarled traffic and sighing and making occasional love to my dear wife. Walter Brennan saw you only once at a Dairy Queen 58 years ago, and in his words, you stole his heart. So that is what he left you. Obviously, I cannot excise Mr. Brennan's heart, cure it, and ship it to you. I was his attorney for 16 years, but I never saw the man cry or even smile until the morning he sat across from me describing your lips as they curled around the stripy straw through which you drank a vanilla milkshake six decades ago. On that morning, Mr. Brennan broke down, sobbed so hard I was forced to lend him my favorite handkerchief. And last night, when I asked my dear wife how on earth to honor Walter K. Brennan's strange bequest, she smiled sagely and asked me one question. What did you do with that handkerchief? Please forgive the state of my handwriting, Mrs. Dale. I have never before composed a piece of correspondence upon a hanky. Yours most sincerely, Paul Wainscott, attorney at law. That's the end. Okay. Thank you so much for reading that, Jen. I love the side comments, by the way. To me, the chat is like one of the one of my favorite things about uh, you know these video conferences. So please keep it going. Um, is Matt Liebel here? Liebel? Liebel, yes. Hi. Oh, okay, there you are. <laughs> Wasn't sure. Okay, great. So um, uh, Matt Liebel, is that how you pronounce it? Liebel. Okay, libel, uh, short fiction has been published in Electric Literature, Portland Review, Carolina Quarterly, Diagram, Wigleaf, Juked, Bengal Lights, and elsewhere. He holds an MFA in writing from Washington University in St. Louis. He lives in San Francisco, where he is a frequent co contributor to the Quiet Lightning Reading Series and a member of the Covered uh, Writers Collective. Here to tell us about my personal brand from X-Ray is Matt Libel. Thanks, Nathan. It's my personal brand. My personal brand is integrity. My personal brand is fresh, innovative thinking and a commitment to excellence. My personal brand sets me apart in the sense that many people refuse to stand within 50 feet of me as if my personal brand stinks or something. My personal brand does not stink, if anything. My personal brand exudes a fresh, clean scent, evocative of wintergreen or 
a cool spring breeze. My personal brand does not harm the skin. My personal brand contains no known carcinogens and has been extensively tested on laboratory rats. Unfortunately, one of the rats has recently escaped his cage. If you happen to see him, do not panic. Do not subject him to an inhumane trap, for this is no ordinary rat, but a spectacular rat, one infused with my own personal brand and all that this entails. You can find out more about my personal brand on my website, mypersonalbrand.ki. All of the other internet domain extensions for my personal brand have been taken, by the way. So I had to use .ki, the extension designated for the tiny Pacific Island, Pacific Ocean Island Republic of Kiribati. I even traveled to Kiribati's main atoll to set up my personal brand's website. That's how new and fresh my personal brand is. In Gilbertese, incidentally, the official language of the E. Kiribati people, the word for dog is Kamea. Apparently, the etymology of this is that European invaders used to say to their dogs, come here, come here. I didn't learn that on Kiribati. I discovered it on the internet. But the internet is only the tip of the iceberg so far as my personal brand goes. Speaking of icebergs, I projected my personal brand onto the face of several massive ones spanning Greenland, Siberia, and Antarctica. You can see videos of these projections on my YouTube channel. They are rather spectacular. I've done all this, by the way, at enormous personal cost, and I'm beginning to wonder if the payoff justifies the expense I've gone to to get my name out there. My personal brand has destroyed both of my marriages and has deeply strained my relationship with my teenage son, Zeke whom I enlisted in my scheme to light up the darkened icy ends of the earth with a giant symbol of myself. This has involved, among other challenges, taking Zeke out of school for an entire year and hiring an instructor to train him in the driving and care of sled dogs. Zeke now vows that he will never forgive me, but he is still young and as yet lacks the perspective on what was truly once in a lifetime unique experience that he will one day thank me for. Which other of his friends have had the chance to enjoy the meaty tang of fresh killed whale meat? And that thanks will come in part via a full-throated endorsement of my personal brand once he himself is in a position to become an influencer slash thought leader uh, slash social media superstar on his own. My personal brand is all about providing unconventional and memorable branded experiences. My personal brand is sticky like that. My personal brand is, and let's just be honest about this, my last real chance at this point. It's a shot in the dark, a rabbit I'm trying to pull out of a hat. And in fact, I've had some hats created for my personal brand, including these premium models made out of genuine rabbit fur. And take it from me and Zeke, these hats will help get you through even the most brutal of winters. My personal brand still hasn't gotten the recognition it deserves, but now is the time to change that. I'm coming to you with an opportunity, in other words, to get in on the ground floor and see your own personal brand piggyback on mine and take flight, not literally as pigs can't fly. My personal brand has now been certified 100% rat free and will focus henceforth only on areas reachable without access to sled or snowmobile. Think about it like this. In the end, all things will die. Penguins will die, whales will die, rats will die, icebergs will die, the e Kiribati will die, I will die, my ex-wives will die, my ungrateful but only son will die, and you, you will die too. But our personal brands will live on long after we're gone. Our personal brands are, in many ways, the ghosts of our lives. And if you don't want to have your own personal ghost, well, you're missing out on a chance to reach the coveted 18 to 45s as personal ghosting is all the rage right now, according to my influencer friends in the know. But if you'd rather not join forces, beware. My personal brand is not fucking around. It will win out in the end because it is desperate. It has no other choice. My personal brand is no longer merely an extension of me. It has become an independent organism, a lab creature on the loose, a monster that I can no longer contain nor, contr nor control. It will not be forgotten. It will not be denied. It will flutter under your floorboards and creep into your brain. It will achieve maximum stickiness. It will make its mark upon you. Thanks.
Yeah, that was so well done. Thank you so much, Matt. Okay, next up we have R.L. Mazes, who is the author of Other People's Pets from Celadon Books. And we love Anderson Cooper, short stories also from Celadon Books. Here to tell us about Le Chien, it, from Monkey Bicycle, and we love Anderson Cooper, is R.L. Mazes. Lachaim. No music accompanied Lila Orr's entrance into the deserted hallway of her parents' home. No one played the famous wedding march that she and Morris Hirsch had settled on after deciding they were too old to get married to the Rolling Stones. The musician had left hours before. From experience, he could tell the difference between the jitters and a decision reached in the 11th hour that the thing was better off not done. He had packed up his organ and congratulated himself on getting paid in advance. Lila's parents had retired to their bedroom, her father still sniffing the cigar he'd planned to smoke during the reception. Silk shoe straps hooked over two fingers, Lila stepped into the yard to find the corgis humping under the chuppah and the cat cleaning its fur. She walked barefoot down the aisle on rose petals whose edges had begun to blacken. Lila waited for the dogs to finish and then picked up Molly, the female. It helped to hold something alive as she surveyed the elegant wreckage. 20 rows of white wooden chairs populated the lawn. To rent a chair for 24 hours cost $5. Was it possible she had spent a year of her life on such things? Holding the dog under one arm, she snapped a few pictures with her phone. She wanted desperately to forget the day, but there would be times when she might want to remember it. Refusing to come out of the study was the bravest thing she had ever done. Better to have said no two years before on Coney Island when Morris presented the two carat ring in a clamshell that still smelled like the sea. Morris's voice was just as nasal then. He had the same habit of correcting her. Better to have broken it off then, but not as brave as breaking it off now, bringing humiliation on herself and Morris and risking her father having a heart attack among his accounting partners and golf buddies. She wondered what had happened to all the food, $45 per person for plated grilled salmon and vegetables and organic locally grown salad. Did the caterer take it down to the shelter, her instruction for the leftovers? She could have eaten a whole salmon, three pieces of wedding cake with buttercream icing. She was that hungry. Relief overshadowed her embarrassment. For the first time in days, since her final fitting, she realized, her lungs expanded to fill her chest. She noticed the scent of crab apple blossoms and the breeze caressing her neck. Her hair was still pinned. It was spring and she was alive and she would not marry Morris. The pottery barn goblet that was to be crushed under Morris's heel as part of the ceremony sat on a small table next to a bottle of Manischewitz. She set the dog down, broke the seal on the wine and filled the glass. The glass would not be broken, not that afternoon, maybe never. L'chaim, she said to herself, to life. Wow. Awesome job. Wow. I'm speechless. Okay, great. Um, Next up, we have Andrea Passwater. Uh, Andrea Passwater's writing has appeared in The Rumpus, Duende, if I'm pronouncing that right, and Boston Accent Lit. A former Alabamian, she now lives in Oakland, California, and she is working on a novel about blacksmiths. I love that. Um, here to tell us about We Sing it from The Rumpus is Andrea Passwater. Um, hey, yeah, so this piece was originally published in The Rumpus. Um, and it is called, We Sing. We love our God and so we love his sister too. Our God has placed us in his pocket, curled us inside his warm hand. We, so suddenly torn from our mother, still missing her belly and warmth, sing his praises as we pile in his palm to fall. Good Lord, who gave us life. 
good Lord who will take us into the world and bring us safely home again. We say goodbyes to our brothers and sisters, pinch and kiss their cheeks. One by one, he plucks us all away, drops us into the wide forest. Young ones, he beams at us and we adore him. Our God tells us to sit vast inches apart and wait. We do not take this easily, the aloneness. We look to each other but cannot move to touch. So he has whispered to us and so we believe. When the Lord returns to gather us up, mother will pull us greedily into her arms. She will marvel at everything we've seen, beg us never to leave her again. But oh, these three arduous trials we do not expect. First comes the wind which blows us to and fro like feathers. It sends dirt upon our soft skin, smudges our faces. We can hardly tell our own brothers and sisters from rocks. We push up over tall twigs and mounds, rolling back to our places again, breathless and matted. We rejoice this overcoming, the tin of its taste, the stories we have to tell. Oh, then come the woodlarks with their talons and beaks. Their sharp, swift dives that take our heads before we know to scream. Their wings unfurl to eclipse the sun, cast a blind black chill before they strike. We raise our voices and sing to our Lord, save us. As the birds circle and caw, pilfering us for their children's mouths. The trees take pity, shield us with their leaves. Our God has placed some of us in brush and others in wide open sun. We accept that some of us, he has chosen to die. We thank the Lord for his wisdom in this, that the birds might retreat before eating us all. The night drapes down over the trees and grass. We, weary and wanting only to sleep, begin to slump our shoulders down into the earth. At last, the mice peek their heads out from their burrows. They scurry to us in the quiet way mice do, tickle us with their little paws and yank us sleeping into their mouths. Too tired now to sing and too few when the black slips behind the mountain, revealing gold and blue in the sky, so few of us left. And our God walking past us, kicking us like pebbles, his sister bringing raindrops upon our backs. We shout joyously to him, our tall promiser covered in sun, and he does not answer, only cries out falsely that we have gone. We have waited here. We said, our voices urgent as he shrinks. Can't you see us? We have waited here. Our God disappeared now for three moons and four suns, our bodies crumbling in the soil. Good Hansel who gave us life, we sing, our mouths scattered across the forest. Thank you. Wow, so good. Thank you so much for reading, Andrea. Okay, next up we have Jackie Rico Turia, who is an MFA candidate at Boise State University, where she teaches and is the associate editor of the Iowa, sorry, the Idaho Review, winner of the Master's Review 2018 Summer Flash Fiction Contest and second place finalist for the 2019 Craft Short Fiction Prize, judged by Elizabeth McCracken. Her work has appeared in the Master's Review, Craft, and Passages North. She lives in Boise, Idaho, where she is currently at work on a novel. Here to tell us about how to spot a whale from the Master's Review is Jackie Rico Turia. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, so this is how to spot a whale. Do not look impressed when Roberta tells you about narwhals, the monodont today, the white whales. 
Do not bat an eye when she talks about their elongated canines, how they twist like candy out of the Arctic Sea. When she says she's heard so much about you, look at your mother. Let her know you see her. When she reaches for a green olive, take one too. Roll the pit over your tongue. Clean it on every side, like your mother taught you. When Roberta talks about her work and your father's, the reason she's come all this way, clench the pit in your teeth and smile wide. Do not pay attention to Roberta's red skirt flapping in the breeze or the cluster of orange freckles that dot her white lady shoulders. Try not to notice the small flip of her nose, her full lips, or the crease of her eyelid. Do not admit you have dreamed of having that crease too. Do not compare your mother's face to her face. If you see the ivory pendant dangling at the line of Roberta's cleavage, look away fast. Do not think about the hollow of your mother's chest or the way she tries to hide it under baggy shirts and blouses. Make sure to ask Roberta questions, questions that will take time to answer, that fill space while your father orders lobsters from a silver airstream. Ask why she decided to study whales, if she still swims in the ocean, what she hopes to find off the coast of Maine. Do not listen to her answers. Hum inside your head. Do not picture the cobalt tributaries or the long stretches of ice that make up her northern territory territories. Look out at the wet, warm sand of Maine. Look down at the row of olive pits your mother is building. Do not make eye contact with either woman. Look at your watch. Tap your sandaled foot on the cement. When your father returns with steaming lobsters and clarified butter, do not look excited. Do not let the thrill show on your face. When your mother stands and says she's going to walk the beach, let her go. Do not laugh when your father calls her a softie. Stare him down when he tells Roberta how your mother won't touch a lobster how she cannot bring herself to crack their joints and tear them limb from limb. Make it clear Roberta should not laugh the way your father is laughing. Know that with your mother gone, you must sing for your dinner. Be ready to know their kingdom, their clade, down to their family, the part of the body you are about to eat. Start with the kelepeds or your father will scold you. Pull the speckled meat from the cling of the exoskeleton. Make it slick with butter. When the shell is picked clean, wipe your hands with a soapy wet nap, point out the yellow corn in Roberta's teeth and ask your father if you may be excused. Follow your mother from a distance. Watch her blue dress flap at her ankles. Stay on the wet part of the sand and feel the chill of the foam at your feet. Watch your mother bend to pick up smooth rocks and broken parts of a shell. Ignore how drab she looks against the gray of the sky. Do not wonder if your father notices that too. When the wind blows your mother's straw hat into the water and she wades in without grace to retrieve it, love her more. Turn away, do not let her know you see her. Go back to your father. Hear Roberta laughing at the picnic table. Watch them suck on small legs, the pariah pod, the last bits of the body that have yet to be eaten. Clear the tray of hollowed carcasses and remember that your mother ate only olives. When Roberta takes a thumb and wipes a smear of butter from your father's face, point to the breaking waves and shout, whales. Be the first to say globicephala, macrorhynchus. Say it how your father taught you. Take your father's hand and rush him up the beach. Tell him you saw their dark gray bodies cutting through the blue curve of a wave. Tell him there are two, three, maybe five to the pod. Speak his language as you bring him to the water's edge, as you pull him back to you, to your mother. Make him look out at the sea, stare at the ocean, hold your father's damp hand and search the waves for the spray of a whale. Thank you. Good. As someone said in chat, I just, I wish I knew the story behind the story on all these wonderful pieces. You know, I mean, to me, it's just so inspiring to read such ingenuity and um, creativity in these works. And that's what it's all about.
I also personally love hearing the voices in my in my ear so that you know when I read them again I sort of can have that ringing in the back of my in the back of my head somewhere somewhere inaccessible probably okay we have two more uh, pieces two more authors uh, at this point our next author is Siamak Vazuki uh, who is an Iranian American writer living in Seattle he has had stories published in uh, Glimmer Train, Kenyan Review, Missouri Review, Chattahoochee Review, and Columbia Journal. His story, Basketball, originally appeared in Atticus Review. Uh, his first collection, Better Than War, received a 2014 Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction. And his second collection, A Sense of the Whole, is due out from Horizon Books. Uh, well, actually, it came out, I guess, already in September 2020. Here to tell us about Basketball from Atticus Review, Siamak Vazuki. All right, thanks so much. Thanks, Nathan, and uh, thank you to all the other writers. Uh, it's really nice to be able to share this uh, stage with you today. Um, yeah, this story is from Atticus Review, and it is called Basketball. One day, she remembered a young man she had known and loved for a little while when she was 25. He would play basketball on Sunday afternoons and he would come to see her afterwards in the evening. He had been trying to tell her once how much he loved basketball and he'd said, it feels like cheating. It had been beautiful to hear it and she had thought that she could love him for a very long time when he'd said that. After it had ended, she'd remembered it and she'd wondered if she had, some, if she had something that felt like cheating. She had thought that she would, even if she didn't then because she was only 25. And she had not wanted to think that the only thing that could do that was love. She was 36 now and there was a man, but he did not feel like cheating. He felt like playing the game correctly. But now at 36, it was hard to say what was cheating and what was playing the game correctly anyway. They blended together. The young man had not been talking of love anyway. He had been talking of basketball. Maybe if her mother and father had been the kind to sign their daughter up for sports, she would know what that meant. There was a basketball court near her house, and now when she saw the little boys playing there and the little girls in the grass nearby, she felt angry. When she remembered the young man, she wondered if she had shown him how much she loved that basketball felt like cheating to him. Maybe she had acted like it was only cute. It had been a funny age. There had been a lot of ways in which she tried to show that she was a woman and not a girl. Maybe she had made him think it was only cute. It was possible. It was possible she didn't know how to show someone that she took it seriously when they told her they had something that felt like cheating. She wanted to ask the man she was with if he had something that felt like cheating. She did not think their, their relationship could bear it though if he did not know what that meant. It was the first sign that she should end it with him and she ended it soon after that. Coming home from the last time of seeing him, she stopped next to the basketball court and watched the game. I want to cheat, she thought. I want to cheat with someone who wants to cheat as well. We are, we are there to cheat no matter what anyone says. She wondered what would happen if she were to run onto the court and tell the boys to make room for the girls in the grass. Two years later, when she had met a man she was beginning to love, she decided she would tell him that she wanted to cheat and that she wanted him to cheat with her as well. It would be her declaration. Men got to make direct declarations all the time. They had all the formal occasions to make them, but a woman had to make hers when she could. On the way to see him, it was very clear in her mind. I believe love should feel like cheating, she would say. It should feel like we are getting away with something we aren't supposed to have. And we should feel like bad criminals lifting our heads up when we shouldn't and looking around us wondering if it's really true. If it's really true that nobody is going to stop us and say, just who do you think you are acting as though you deserve happiness? And then she remembered the young man who had said that basketball felt like cheating. And for the first time, she thought it was very foolish that basketball was the thing that felt like cheating to him. What a small and insignificant thing to feel like cheating. It wasn't even cute. No wonder she had ended it with him. She had known back then at 25 that there was only one thing that was the real cheating. 
She'd had to wait many years before she could explain to a man what the real cheating was. If boys and men could spend as much, spend as much time thinking of love as they did throwing a ball into a hoop, they could all start cheating together much sooner. She thought of the basketball court again and she did not, did not want to bring the girls onto the court anymore. She wanted to bring the boys to the grass. By the time she got to his house and sat down with him to talk, she knew it was going to come out angry. She had not planned for it to come out angry, but she thought it was better that it come out angry than not come out at all. She told him how she believed that love was cheating, that it was the only cheating, and that she was looking for someone to cheat with, to cheat against all that was small and foolish and meaningless in life. It came out angry, but the anger was deserved. The man was moved by all of it, including the anger. He had never thought of love as cheating before, but he understood it and he told her he wanted to cheat with her as well. The next day when she went past the basketball court, she thought it was a beautiful scene. It was the same as always, the boys on the court and the girls in the grass. And the only thing she felt compelled to do was to tell the boys to play, to play, but to pay close attention to their playing. Because it, if it ever felt so good that it felt like cheating, then the idea was that it was telling them about something else. And she imagined them asking her what that other thing was. And she imagined her smi herself smiling and walking away. All right, thanks. The silent clapping is so strange. <laughs> like, <laughs> looking at everyone clap. Hopefully you can hear their claps in the, in the screen. <laughs> Uh, wonderful job. So uh, that was wonderfully read. And uh, as people mentioned, it's such a, a warm and um, resonating piece. Um, our last author is Jennifer Wortman, who is a 2020 National Endowment of the Arts Fellow and the author of the short story collection, This, This, This is Love, 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 Split Lip Press 2019. Her work appears in Tri-Quarterly, Copper Nickel, Glimmer Train, Electric Literature, Smoke Long Quarterly, Brevity, and elsewhere. She lives with her family in Colorado, where she serves as associate editor for the Colorado Review and teaches at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Here to tell us about the very creatively titled Theories of the Point of View Shift in ACDC's You Shook Me All Night Long from, Ele from Electric Literature, please welcome Jennifer Wortman. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you everyone for the stunning readings. Um, I'm not sure this piece translates wonderfully to being read aloud. There's some visual cues, so I just wanna set it up for you a little bit. Um, there are six numbered sections, but each section has two parts and I will try to mark them by pausing between so you don't get too confused. Theories of the point of view shift in ACDCs you shook me all night long. One, the speaker, let's call him Brian, is documenting the shift a la Boover from I it to I thou relations, from subject object to intersubjectivity. Confronted with his lover's fast machine and clean motor, Brian can no longer maintain his stance as autonomous male subject gazing upon the other. He and his lover merge. He is shaken. Was I not a sufficiently fast machine? Did I not keep my motor clean? I cleansed assiduously for you, removed hairs, performed ablutions. True, over time I relaxed a little, cleansed and removed less of myself slowed down, but is love not a sagging into each other, a softening of edges and ooze? Was my dirt and languor not yours too? Two, the woman to whom Brian refers in the verse differs from the woman or man or non-binary individual he addresses in the chorus. He uses talk of the woman in the verse to seduce via uh, Elation, jealousy, aspiration, etc. the choral you. If I speak to you of a woman's ability to knock me out with her American thighs, Brian reasons, you will then want to knock me out with yours. His reasoning bears out, he is shaken. 
You often spoke of how dumb she was. You didn't use that word, but you implied and I inferred. A groupie you called her, a wannabe who imposed upon your time with totally tributes to your poetry. I'd seen her at parties, assertively busty, cosmetically lacquered, flagrantly blonde. After said parties, I'd follow your lead and mock her. After said parties, I'd follow your lead and fuck you hard. Three, after losing his lover, Brian can't bring himself to address her, yet much remains unsaid. He recounts their time together until, overcome by memories of their all night shaking, he calls to her across the ether. If he reminds her of their shaking, crows it over the roar of guitars, will she hear? Will she tell him to come even though, in a sense, he was already there? Only later did I realize how much she resembled your ex. Later still, I realized my once careful grooming may have been a response to a photo I'd seen of your ex who'd managed in her appearance to blend purity and smut, perfection and invitation to blemish, to ravage and raid. Did you still love your ex? I called across the ether. Did you now love the groupie? Had you ever loved me? Four. Brian is masturbating. The woman is a product of his mind and you is himself. Her truth telling, her double time on the seduction line, her meal making. These are all Brian's fabrications, his creation of an ideal woman who is fast, mechanical, immaculate, superlative, unseeing, authentic, strong, greedy, domineering, hardworking, inimitable, faithful, humble, ravenous, calming, violent. She doesn't exist, and Brian, unable to compromise his ideal, is left to shake himself. Once I awoke and you weren't in bed, I found you in the living room pleasuring yourself. How hard you'd shut your eyes, as if trapping whatever fantasy girl you formed in your brain. If I'd been working double time on the seduction line, I would have shimmied over and joined in but I'd been depressed. I didn't know why, but I knew it was my fault. How devoted you'd recently been, yet I'd failed to satisfy you. What's more, I'd forgotten to shower. I stank of myself. Five, Brian is anxious because he has to fill the shoes of ACDC's previous singer, Bond, who died of alcohol poisoning. A product of his anxiety and his co-writer's grief, the point of view shift is an oversight, a mistake that betrays subconscious feelings for Bond. Why did he leave them? If he returned, they would shake him all night long, each for their own reasons. Unable to acknowledge their pain, they cloak their urges in boast of heterosexual intercourse, projecting their need to shake a dead man onto a feminized other. One day you disappeared, ghosted they call it, a misnomer. A ghost is a presence where there should be an absence. You were gone when you were supposed to be here. The morning you vanished, I flitted bird-like from room to room, my head jerking at strange angles, searching for you. When I understood what you'd done, I wanted to shake you until answers flew from your throat. Instead, I rammed myself against the wall, which gently shuddered and left on my shoulder, a chlorine blue bruise. Six, Brian is documenting, per the Song of Songs, an encounter with the divine. Unable to evoke his sacred love with mundane language, he turns to the sensual, celebrating God's feminine aspects. However, Brian understands the vocabulary of masculine and feminine can only be metaphor. As the ultimate you, God transcends material forms and their signifiers, yet God also inhabits them. Brian's confrontation with this paradox unites him with the supreme mystery. He is shaken, he is shaker. If you were my God, then whom did you worship? All poetry you'd once said entreats the divine. When you knelt before me and made me scream, was my pleasure a poem? a song to yourself. My idol, you smashed me 
yet I thank thee, I thank thee, alone with the mess of me, I'm shaken and shaking, shaking and shaken, I'm God of myself. Thank you. That's a wrap, folks. Great piece to end with. Excellent work from all authors. Thank you so much for giving your afternoon, a little bit of your afternoon to uh, share your work. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Um, please check out the anthology. Be safe, be well, happy holidays, and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Nathan. You.